Hey everyone, we have one more type of Punnett square to talk about. This one is called a die hybrid cross. So die means two hybrid, we're putting two different things together. And so what this type of Punnett square does is it looks at two different traits that are being inherited at the same time. So for example, in humans, if we wanted to calculate the probability of offspring inheriting both the trait of free versus attached earlobes and the ability to roll their tongue or not roll their tongue. So then we would use a dihybrid cross to figure out the probability of inheriting both of those traits at the same time. Um, so you might notice from this diagram right here that the dihybrid cross contains 16 boxes. It's four by four instead of four boxes or two by two. So this one is using Mendel's pea plants. It's talking about seed shape and color. Um, we're not gonna go over this one, um, but we're gonna do a different one as an example together. All right, let's move my face right here. Okay, um, so like I was saying, we are gonna be looking at two different traits at the same time. We're going to be looking at free versus attached earlobes and also the ability to roll the tongue or not roll the tongue. So that... now before we get started with the die hybrid cross, I want to do two separate crosses for these two separate traits just to sort of walk through some of the theory behind why the die hybrid cross works. So as you can see, I have the slides separated into two different halves, one for each trait. So we have the earlobe trait over here and we have the tongue rolling trait over here. Now, both of these parental genotypes are the same parents. So I'll use my parents as an example. So my mom's name is Judy, my dad's name is Alan. So these red letters right here are both representing Judy and these blue letters right here are both representing Alan. So we're gonna be calculating the probability of each trait separately before we do it together. So we should know how to set these Punnett squares up at this point in time. So these parents, Alan and Judy, they are heterozygous for both traits. So they have one dominant allele, one capital letter, and one recessive allele, one lowercase letter for both of the traits. So we're gonna take Judy's alleles and write them down the side of this Punnett square. We're gonna take Alan's alleles and write them across the top of this Punnett square. We're then gonna fill the Punnett square in as we know how to do. So big E, big E, big E, little E, big E, little E, and then little E, little E. So nothing new right here. We should be able to see that for the phenotypic ratios, uh, we have three boxes that have a capital letter or a dominant allele. So that means three out of four or 75% of the offspring will have free earlobes. And then one out of four or 25% of the offspring will have attached earlobes. Let's do it for the tongue rolling. So we're going to take Judy's alleles, write them down the side of the Punnett square. We're going to take Alan's alleles, write them across the top of the Punnett square excuse me, we're going to fill the Punnett square in and we get the same ratios. So we have three out of four boxes that have a dominant allele. So three out of four or 75% will be able to roll their tongue. And then one out of four or 25% will not be able to roll their tongue. So keep this in mind as we go to the next slide. All right. So Based off of the Punnett squares that we just did, so we have our little hint or reminder up here, these were our phenotypic ratios, we're going to review how to calculate the probability of two separate events occurring at the same time. So this is similar to if I wanted to calculate the probability of rolling two separate die and having one of them land on a three and one of them land on a four. So as a reminder, the way that we calculate this is we multiply both probabilities together. So for example, if we're looking at both dominant traits for the two different traits, 
Um, that would be free earlobes and tongue rolling. We would take the probability of inheriting free earlobes, which is 75% or three out of four, and we would multiply that by the probability of, of inheriting tongue rolling. So again, that would be 75% or three out of four. So basically we are multiplying three fourths by three fourths. And as a reminder, when we multiply fractions, we multiply the numerator, which is the top number. So three times three is nine. And then we multiply the denominator or the bottom number. So four times four is 16. So if we wanted to calculate the probability of inheriting free earlobes and tongue rolling, we multiply them together to get nine out of 16 chance of inheriting both free earlobes and tongue rolling. Now we can do the same thing for the other combinations of traits. So in this case, we're gonna be looking at one dominant trait and one recessive trait. So free earlobes and no tongue rolling. Free earlobes is three out of four. We multiply that by no tongue rolling, which is one out of four. So three fourths times one fourth is three times three is three, or three times one is three, four times four is 16. So we have a three out of 16 chance of inheriting both free earlobes and no tongue rolling. Same thing for the reverse order. Um, so if we look at the recessive trait and then the dominant trait, attached earlobes is one out of four, so one out of four. We multiply that by the probability of inheriting tongue rolling, which is the dominant trait, so three out of four. So again, three fourths times one fourth is three out of 16. So there's a three out of 16 chance of inheriting attached earlobes and tongue rolling. Finally, I know it's covering it a little bit. I don't know how to fix it, I apologize. Um, we're gonna look at both recessive traits at the same time. So let me stop moving my mouse so we can see. And you are gonna see attached earlobes is one out of four, free or tongue roll, no tongue rolling is one out of four. So one fourth times one fourth is one sixteenth. So you have a one out of 16 chance of inheriting attached earlobes and no tongue rolling. Okay, so let's remember these numbers and I will have the hint on the slide when we need it. But let's remember these numbers as we move into how to set up and complete a dihybrid cross. The idea is we should be able to calculate these same probabilities using a dihybrid cross that we were able to calculate using two separate Punnett squares and then multiplying our probabilities together. There we go. Okay, so for the dihybrid cross, before we can even set up the Punnett square, um, let's take a look at the parental genotypes right now. So again, we're still looking at Judy and Alan, um, and what you're seeing here is Judy's genotype. So the two E's are representing free and attached earlobes, the two T's are representing tongue rolling, and that's the same thing that you see with Alan over here. Um, also notice that we are writing our genotype in alphabetical order. So E's come before T's. And then the other convention we have to keep in mind is that capital letters are written before lowercase letters. So we first go alphabetical and then we go capital to lowercase. So that's why you're seeing big E, little E, big T, little T. Now, when we're setting up this 16 box Punnett square, it's four by four. It's really tempting to take one allele and just put it next to the box, similar to what we've been doing. So let me get a whiteboard out really quick to show you. All right, kind of messy, um, but the idea is a lot of people We'll say like, I'll put the big E here, little E here, big T, little T. This is wrong. Don't do that. Um, we need to keep our gametes together. So remember when alleles are inherited, they're inherited through gametes, which means that each gamete is going to have one E and one T. Um, so this can be a combination of big E's and little T's, and we need to figure out what all of our different possible combinations are to set up these gametes with our different alleles. So to help us do that, I have an acronym right here called FOIL. 
So the F in FOIL stands for first, the O in FOIL stands for outside, the I in FOIL stands for inside, and the L in FOIL stands for last. And I will explain what that means. So when we're looking at a genotype, in this case, both Judy and Alan have the same genotype, they're heterozygous for both traits. We are going to figure out the different possible gametes that we can create. So like I said, each gamete needs one E and one T. So F for first, I'm looking at the first E and the first T. And so my first gamete is going to be big E, big T. It's gonna have both dominant alleles. And so I wrote it twice, once for Judy, once for Alan. I know both of them are in red. That's because I'm looking at red for F for foil versus male and female. All right, so O stands for outside. So I'm looking at the outside E and the outside T. So in this case, we have the big E paired with the little T. So one dominant allele and one recessive allele, still two different traits. I stands for inside, so I'm looking at the inside E and the inside T. So we get a gamete that's little e, big T. And then lastly, the L is for last. So I'm looking at the last E and the last T. So our gamete will have both recessive alleles, little e, little t. All right, so if you are having trouble following along, you can always rewatch this video. You can always go through the slide deck on your own, but FOIL is meant to help you figure out the different gamete combinations for the alleles. So now that we have our different combinations, we can now start to set up our dihybrid cross Punnett square. All right, so like I said, dihybrid crosses, we need 16 boxes, four by four. So one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Now here are the possible gamete combinations that we came up with. And I've went back to labeling them for Judy versus Alan. So red for Judy, blue for Alan. So we are gonna take each gamete combination and write that next to our box or above our box. There you go. Um, so what you can see here, big E, big T, big E, big T, big E, little T, big E, little T, little E, big T, little E, big T, and then little E, little T, little E, little T. So same thing across the top for Allen because they have the same genotype. Now, when we go to fill in our Punnett square, instead of having two letters per a box, we're now gonna have four letters per a box. So we still have two of each allele for the possible zygote that we're creating, the possible offspring that we're creating. Each possible offspring still has two alleles per a trait, but there's two traits. So there's gonna be four alleles in total in each box for each possible offspring. So we fill it in the same way, we follow our E and T into this box, we follow our E and T into this box. And so we get big E, big E, big T, big T. So as a reminder, we are writing things alphabetically, so E before T, and then we write the capital letter before the lowercase letter. So let's see how that looks in this box right here. So I'm gonna bring my E and T over this way. I'm gonna bring my E and T down to this box right here. So again, we get big E, big E, big T, little t. So again, capital or alphabetical first, and then I'm looking at capital versus lowercase. So let's do this box right here. So again, I'm gonna bring my big E and big T over to this box. I'm gonna bring my little E and big T down to this box. So we're getting big E, little E, big T, big T. Let's do one more. This box right here. So I'm going to bring my big E and big T over. I'm going to bring my little E and little T down. So we get big E, little E, big T, little T. And you're going to do the same thing for all of these 16 boxes right here. If you are having trouble following along, I suggest that you go back to a blank Punnett square and try doing this on your own 
on a piece of paper and just work through it. And then you can compare what you got to this Punnett square right here, just to practice and make sure that you're understanding how to do this. So now that we have our Punnett square completed, we do have to go in and look at our phenotypic ratios. I think that works. Okay. So because we're looking at two traits at the same time, our phenotypic ratios are going to include both traits. So our first trait that we are looking for is free earlobes and tongue rolling. We're looking for boxes that have both dominant traits, which means the box needs to have at least one capital E and one capital T. So we see that here. So big E, big T, big E, big T, big E, big T, et cetera. Excuse me. So I've circled all nine boxes that have both dominant phenotypes for the two traits. So we're gonna get nine out of 16 for free earlobes and tongue roll or the dominant and dominant trait. For free earlobes and no tongue roll, this is a dominant trait paired with a recessive trait. So we're gonna need one big E for the free earlobes, but the T's both have to be lowercase so that we can have a recessive trait of no tongue rolling. So that's what you see as an example right here. Big E, two little T's. Big E, two little T's. And so there's gonna be three boxes like that in total or three out of 16. All right, for the next phenotypic ratio, we have attached earlobes, which is the recessive trait, and we have tongue rolling, which is the dominant trait. So we need two little E's and at least one big T. So two little E's, one big T, two little E's, one big T, two little E's, one big T. So again, this is three out of 16. Finally, I know it's covering it up right now. Let me stop moving my mouse. Um, we're looking for the two recessive traits. So attached earlobes and no tongue rolling, which means we need all lowercase letters. You will see that in the final box that is not circled. So I'm going to click. There we go. Um, and that's going to be one out of 16. Now, before we got started with the dihybrid cross, Remember that we did this same thing with two separate Punnett squares, and we calculated the ratios, the phenotypic ratios, based off of those two separate Punnett squares by multiplying each ratio together. These are the same ratios that we got, the 9 out of 16, 3 out of 16, 3 out of 16, 1 out of 16. These are the same ratios that we calculated from this dihybrid cross that we also calculated by using two separate Punnett squares and multiplying our ratios together. So that's why we did that other way first to show you where it's coming from and to show you that this dihybrid cross does work. Um, you will never be expected to like produce your own dihybrid cross on your own. You will always be given some sort of structure to look at. So maybe it's set up for you and you have to fill in this middle part right here. Maybe everything is filled out for you and you just have to count the boxes and calculate the different ratios for the different uh, phenotypes. Um, but you need to understand what this dihybrid cross is showing you, how to read this dihybrid cross. Um, you do not have to set it up on your own. So we just have a couple more things to talk about for um this inheritance pattern um not this specific inheritance pattern but inheritance patterns in general so there's no punnett square for this but we do have to be aware that there is such a thing as a polygenic trait so poly means many so this is a many gene trait which means that we have many genes that affect just one trait so a great example of this is skin color and height um, so this diagram right here is showing us skin color. What you will see over here is that we have three separate genes. So gene A, gene B, and gene C that all affect skin color. And depending on if you have the dominant allele for A, B, or C, or the recessive allele for A, B, or C, that will change your potential skin color. You'll also see that because of this, instead of having just like 
it's gonna be bad. Instead of just having, no, I'm gonna, instead of just having like a purple versus green color, it's a spectrum of colors. So what you'll see here is that we have very light skin over here. We have some like in the middle skin over here, and then we have very dark skin over here. And so this shape that the graph is creating is called a bell curve. And basically what this is telling us is that the average is somewhere in the middle. So the majority of people are going to land somewhere in the middle over here in terms of skin color, but there are some extremes or some outliers on either end of the spectrum. So you can have like really, really, really light skin color or really, 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 really dark skin color, or more likely you're somewhere in the middle here. Um, so same thing with height. If you line everybody up, you can get like, I'm 5'3". So you can get a bunch of people that all are measured to be five feet, three inches tall. But you'll see even within that, there's a lot of, um, there's a there's a spectrum of 5'3 people. Some people are just over 5'3", some people are just under 5'3". And so you'll see the same thing with height. It's a bell curve and you can be many, many, many different heights and it's affected by many traits. Um, so this is the last part that we have to understand for inheritance patterns, and that's basically a genetic family tree, which is called a pedigree. So a family tree is a way to document basically your ancestry. Um, so for example, I can be like person Y over here, and then I can look through and see like, this would be my sister. I don't have a sister, but in this scenario. Um, so this might be me, this might be my sister, here are our two parents, and then here are our grandparents up here. Um, so basically for a pedigree, circles are representing females, or I should say biological females. Squares are representing biological males. When you have the line drawn between them like this, this horizontal line, that means that they are married or there's some sort of union between them. Basically, they're having children together. So that means that this line right here connecting to these different people, these are all the children or the offspring of our P generation up here. So remember, P generation is the parental generation. So this mom and this dad had four kids. They had a girl, a girl, a boy, and a girl. And now what you can see here is that, for example, this girl, the firstborn girl, because it does go in chronological order. So this would be the oldest, second oldest, third oldest, youngest. Um, so the oldest female married union had a baby with this male over here. And they had three offspring. So they had two girls and one boy. Over here, this male um, married offspring, had offspring with this female right here, and they had two uh, female offspring. And then um, this youngest female over here, again, is having babies with this male, and they had three male offspring. So that's what this is showing you. Now, when you see the different shapes shaded in, it just means that they have whatever trait that you are trying to track. So, for example, if we wanted to track a genetic disorder such as sickle cell anemia, um, so sickle cell anemia, it's a genetic disorder. It affects the shape of your red blood cells. And instead of having here, let me draw again. Usually your red blood cells, they look from the side like a peanut shape kind of like that, or from the top, they'll look circular, but they're kind of like a donut type of shape. Now with sickle cell anemia, what you're gonna see is that the red blood cells are going to kind of look like a moon shape, they're sickled, um, and basically they don't carry oxygen as well. It is a autosomal recessive trait, so I'm gonna use A for anemia to represent sickle cell anemia. So if you're capital A, you're normal, but if normal, there we go. If you're a lowercase a, you will have sickle cell anemia, okay? Um, so you need two little a's in order to have this genetic disorder. It makes it really hard to get oxygen to your cells. 
Usually people are walking around with a little oxygen tank attached to them. They can't do a lot of physical activity because they just can't get the oxygen to their cells. It is very, very common in places that have a lot of malaria. For whatever reason, if you are heterozygous, so big A, little a, um, if you are heterozygous, it gives you immunity to malaria. So that's why it stayed around. Um, but if you have the two recessive alleles, it does give you this genetic disorder. Anyway, let's say that we are tracking sickle cell anemia. And if you are shaded in, so if you are fully colored in, that means that you have sickle cell anemia or you have both recessive alleles. So this person will be little a, little a. This person will be little a, little a. And they both have sickle cell anemia. If you are not shaded in, that means that you are normal. So for example, these people right here, both of them are gonna have at least one big A to have a normal phenotype. In this diagram right here, if you are shaded in halfway, so like this person or this person or this person, this means you're heterozygous. So you are a carrier, which means you can pass the trait on to the next generation. However, you don't necessarily show the phenotype of that trait. So that means, excuse me, this person would be big A, little a, big A, little a, big A, little a. They're all heterozygous. So we're going to look at this pedigree right here. And this pedigree is tracking another genetic disorder called Parkinson's disease. Um, Parkinson's disease, it usually shows symptoms later in life around like 40-ish years old, and it is a neurological degenerative disease. So basically you lose control over your ability to control your body movements. Um, so at first you might notice things like a hand tremor it will shake a little bit, Eventually, that person will be wheelchair bound because they lose their ability to walk because they can no longer control their legs. Um, and eventually it it kills you. So it kills you early. You're, you're normally dead by like 60. It is genetic. So we can track this in a family tree. Now, when we're looking at this pedigree right here, um, we have our little allele key over here. So big P is normal. Little P is Parkinson's disease. So again, this is a recessive trait. Um, so if you are big P, big P, you're going to be normal. If you are big P, little P, heterozygous, you are going to be normal, but you can pass it on to your offspring. And if you are little P, little P, this means you have Parkinson's disease. You will show symptoms around 40 and you will die around 60. Sad, but that's life. So when we are looking to fill in the genotypes of these different people here, we first can look at anyone who is fully shaded in. So this guy right here, this girl right here, this guy right here, et cetera. Because um, these people are shaded in, we know that they're going to be, come on. We know that they're gonna be little p, little p. They all have Parkinson's disease. So anyone shaded in, we know their genotype and we can start there because that will be a good hint to tell us what other people's genotypes are too. I didn't drag. <sighs> I do. All right, so everyone that is shaded in has now been labeled as homozygous recessive or two little p's. So now based off of what we know, we can start to figure out other people's genotypes. So we're gonna look at whoever is heterozygous, which means they are normal, but they are a carrier. So they have the potential to pass it on to their offspring. I'm gonna start with this person right here, number six. And I'm gonna look at their child down here. So their child over here has Parkinson's disease because they are shaded in. We know 
that this child right here got one little pee from mom because mom also has Parkinson's disease. She shaded in two. But this child had to get a second little pee from dad. Now, this is dad, number six. Dad is not shaded in, so he's normal, but he still passed on a little P to his son. So we know that dad has to have a big P to make himself normal, and he has to have a little P to pass it on to his offspring. Um, so we can keep going with this as well. So again, we can look at number seven um, right here. So number seven, dad has Parkinson's disease, so automatically you get a little P. They're normal, so they have to have a big P to make them normal. So again, they're going to be heterozygous or a carrier, big P, little P, for Parkinson's disease. We can make the same assumption for number eight as well because of the same parents and the same phenotype. All right, so let's pause for a second and take a look. Um, this doesn't make sense, this person down here. Yeah, we can look at this person too. We can look at um, 9 and 12 because they're going to be very, very similar. So different set of parents. Dad is normal. Mom has Parkinson's disease. Um and so looking at this, because both of these people are normal, but mom has Parkinson's disease, they have to have a little P coming from mom, but they have to have a big P to make them normal, which came from dad. So again, we can label this. There we go. Right here. Now we can actually do the same thing for both of our parents up here, our P generation. We know that both of these parents are normal phenotypically. However, if we look at their offspring, um, some of their offspring did get Parkinson's disease. Or actually, we can't. So for number three, um, one of their offspring did get Parkinson's disease, which means that one little P came from mom, but that other little P had to come from dad. So that's how we know that dad is also heterozygous. Um, Hmm. I'm just taking a look here to see what's the next easiest one. So for, uh, for the rest of these, we actually can't be completely sure what their genotype is. Um, oh, actually, sorry, I missed number 14. 14 should be uh, heterozygous as well because mom has little p, dad has big p, this person is normal. For the rest of these, we can't be completely sure what their, pheno what their genotype is, but we do know their phenotype. So what you're seeing here is I have big p and a dash. Because they're all normal, they all have to have at least one big p, but we don't know for sure if they have one big p and one little p or one big p or I should say two big P's. So if they're homozygous dominant or heterozygous. And so based off of that pedigree, it's sort of like a little puzzle. We are able to figure out most people's genotypes based off of the information we were given. So again, you are never gonna be asked to like draw your own pedigree, but you have to be able to read it and understand what it's saying and you have to be able to figure out people's genotypes based off of the information in the pedigree. So check in with your vocab notebook at this point. Um, make sure that you are filling in all of the different words that you need to fill in. Again, make sure that you are understanding how to do a dihybrid cross and how to read a pedigree, and I will see you in the next video.